Welcome back to the Ninja Nerd Podcast. Today we're talking about the approach to hematuria, and we're joined by the lovely little Ellie here. This is our French bulldog. <laughs> She's hanging out for just a, just a quick second. So case one, solve the cause of this case. We have a 65-year-old man presents to the clinic with painless hematuria and clots in his urine. The patient reports that he first noticed blood in his urine about three weeks ago. It was initially intermittent, but has become more consistent. He now notices clots in the urine. He denies any pain, burning, difficulty urinating. He has no history of urinary, urinary tract infections or kidney stones. He mentions a 20-pound weight loss over the last six months, which he attributes to a lack of appetite. That'll never happen for us. <laughs> <laughs> One could wish. Yeah, well, if that if that happens to us, we are dying. Yeah, something's definitely Very, wrong. very something uh, bad is happening. I usually just fucking eat pizza over the sink like a rat. Yeah, <laughs> yep, yep, shovel it down. Past medical history, we have hypertension, control with medication, 40-pack year history of smoking. However, he did quit 10 years ago. Uh, and he has a history of occupational exposure to chemicals in a manufacturing plant. For his physical, vitals is 130 over 80. Heart rate 72. Respirations is 16. Temp is 98.1. We have a well-appearing male, no distress. Um, abdominal, no palpable masses, non-tender, no CVA tenderness. For genitourinary, there's no abnormalities, no visual, no visible lesions. Zach, what is your next step in the diagnostic approach, and what do you have on your list of differential diagnoses? When a patient comes in with hematuria, um, the first thing that you want to try to do is generate a diagnostic schema. Um, and I like to say the first thing I want to know is, is it glomerular or non-glomerular hematuria? That's the first thing I like to do. Um, and so the way that I would do that is by getting a urinalysis with microscopy looking to see is there any dysmorphic red blood cells, red blood cell casts. Um, I want to get a urine protein to creatinine ratio because if there's lots of urine protein, that could suggest maybe like a glomerular nephritis. Um, and then I even want to get a, a, a renal function panel, see if there is any kind of elevation in the creatinine, you know, increase in the BUN, things to that nature. So that that's the first thing I like to think about. If I've ruled out that there's any glomerular nephritis, then I'm stuck with trying to figure out, okay, where could the bleeding be occurring? Is it at the kidney? Is it at the ureter? Is it at the bladder, the bladder neck, or the prostate? Um, and so that's something that I have to start kind of forming in my, my mindset. And history usually would be the key thing there, um, but also the timing of their hematuria. So I want to know, are they having hematuria throughout the entire time when they're peeing? So uh, complete hematuria throughout that entire time, uh, entire time frame makes me think about the kidney, the ureter as a potential source. Um, if they only have blood at the end of urination, then that makes me think about a bladder, bladder neck problem. And if they have bleeding at the initial part um, of their urine, then that makes me think about something at the urethra. Um, this one seems like it's pretty consistent throughout. Um, and then on top of that, signs of gross hematuria or clots in the urine is really, really concerning for like potentially in this particular patient. I'd be worried about malignancy. So there's a couple things that I'm starting to think about. One. I'd be really worried since there's a smoking history, mm -hmm. um, there's a history of occupational exposure and they're elderly and they have clots in the urine. I'm really worried about bladder cancer, but I would also want to make sure I don't rule out, I don't miss a uh, renal cell carcinoma. So I'm already, I'm a little bit concerned for malignancy potentially. So that's the first thing is I'm, I'm thinking about. Um, so I would go ahead and get some labs. I get the urinalysis microscopy. I get a urine protein. Um, and then on top of that, I would even, since I'm really concerned and there's a high risk of malignancy, I probably get a CT urogram and a cystoscopy. And the reason why you do that is anybody who is greater than 60, who has a uh, very significant pack, uh, uh, pack per day smoking history, um, who has occupational exposures um, and has gross hematuria, which is recurrent and with clots, high risk of malignancy, you get a CT urogram to rule out renal cell carcinoma a cystoscopy to rule out bladder cancer. And then sometimes I'm just going to throw it in there, a urine cytology if you give it to me, um, because it helps a little bit with seeing if there's any atypical cells suspicious for malignancy. That's, so that's what I'm thinking is I'm thinking this is more not glomerular, but a lot of the urinalysis and other studies will give me the answer. So you mentioned first a urinalysis with microscopy. We have a few different results here for you. Okay. We have gross hematuria with clots, no proteinuria, no casts, Numerous red blood cells. For our urine cytology, we have atypical cells. Okay. Imaging findings for the CT urography, there is no evidence of upper urinary tract lesions or disease. For the cystoscopy, we have a large lesion of the bladder with active bleeding. 
Okay. So, so what's the diagnosis? Yeah. So with this one, it's definitely in this patient, it's likely bladder cancer. Um, and so the way that you kind of form your differential again is hematuria. Is there proteinuria, red blood cell cast, dysmorphic red blood cells? There's not. No glomerulonephritis. If there is not any of those things, then you think, is there any flank t- pain, uh, like acute onset? Think about nephrolithiasis. A CT urogram would also show me that. There's no stones. Um, the other thing I would think about, is there any history of dysuria, frequency, urgency, pyelonephritis, and UTIs can also cause that? I'd be seeing potentially like white blood cell casts, fevers, maybe a leukocytosis and something like that. Nothing really cues me off in their symptoms to think that this could be a UTI as well. So then I think about like weird ones, polycystic kidney disease, renal papillary necrosis. And then I think about renal cell carcinoma. And then I think about bladder cancer. The CT urogram, no lesions of the kidney, nothing in the ureter. Cystoscopy, there's my lesion. So this is likely, unfortunately, bladder cancer for this patient. That's likely the cause of their, their gross hematuria. All right, so let's move on to case two try and solve the cause like uh, we did for case one. We have a 25-year-old woman presents to the ED with dark-colored urine and swelling around her eyes. She reports that her urine has been tea-colored for the past week. She notices swelling in her eyelids, particularly in the morning. She's been feeling more fatigued than usual, but attributes that to her busy schedule as a college student. She denies any dysuria, fever, or recent infections. However, she mentions a sore throat about two weeks ago that resolved on its own. Past medical history, No real pertinent uh, past medical history, no known allergies. For her vitals, her BP is 150 over 95, heart rate is 80, respiration is 18, temp 98.9. She appears tired, mild periorbital edema. There are no murmurs, normal heart sounds, and there's no peripheral edema present. For abdominal, non-tender, no masses, normal bowel sounds. Overall, a pretty normal appearing woman. Zach, what's your next step in the diagnostic approach, and what do you have on your mind for the list of differential diagnoses? Yeah, so when I hear the the, the dark colored urine or the tea colored urine, um, again, you, when you see that, you maybe think that they're experiencing hematuria. So again, first thing I want to think about is is it real? Because <laughs> I've had concerns. I remember one time I had like the the eggs that like the beet beet colored eggs, and I had a bunch of them. And I remember the next day I peed, and I was like. Oh my gosh, I'm dying. I have yeah, I have yeah, something yeah. going on. There's but, blood everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> but there's actually something called like beet urea. So sometimes people, if you have too many beets, you can actually have kind of a darker colored urine. Mine's the other cool. the other issue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're drinking just too much of something but clear. No, I'm I'm saying oh, like when oh. I when I poop, it looks like I. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. really cancer. It's not my urine. It's, I, I, it's, I think I have a GI bleed. Yeah, I got you. Yeah, <laughs> that yeah. makes sense now. So. When you think about those things, you want to make sure that you rule those out. And so I get a ur- I get a urinalysis um, with microscopy, and I would want to make sure is there truly blood, and is there or is it just heme positive? Because sometimes you can get patients who have rhabdo or hemolysis or something like that, and that could cause like these like false positive signs. So it's not really blood; it's just the pigments in their urine that are similar to hemoglobin. So that's the first thing: get a urinalysis with microscopy, make sure it's actually true hematuria. Then from there, again, is it glomerular, non glomerular? Look for dysmorphic red blood cells, red blood cell cast. Look for heavy amounts of protein urea. That's right away what I would go with. Some things that are making me a little bit interesting here. This is a common clinical vignette of a young person who had a sore throat, like strep infection. Yeah. They have hypertension. You shouldn't have a child who has hypertension. And then on top of that, they have periorbital edema. That's a classic finding of like post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis. So I think this patient has glomerulonephritis. And that's my suspicion. But I'm going to go ahead and get those those tests. And then what I would do is if the urinalysis of microscopy came back positive for red blood cell cast, dysmorphic red blood cells, heavy amount of protein urea, then I would add on other titers. I would look, do they have a history of an, a recent strep infection, anti-DNAs, B antibodies, ASO antibodies. I would even rule out lupus, ANA, anti-double-stranded DNA, rule out ankylvasculitis, check ANCA, CMP, check anti-GBM antibodies. Check hepatitis B, C titers, all of those things, and just make sure that I'm not missing anything. The other thing is that this patient is low risk of malignancy. So when you have a patient who's low risk of malignancy, I don't really go right away uh, to picking uh, like a, a CT urogram. Yeah. Maybe I'll get like a renal ultrasound just to make sure I'm not missing anything else too, like a stone uh, that could be potentially there. So that's kind of what I would do is I would get a urinalysis. I would get a renal function panel. Depending upon the results of those, 
I would add on those additional titers and maybe even a renal ultrasound. So let's start with the urinalysis results first. We get the urinalysis and we, we see hematuria with red blood cell cast, mild proteinuria. We get some additional testing. We have a serum creatinine of 2.2. ASO titer is elevated. Anti-DNA B is elevated. C3 complement, low. C4 complement, normal. C anca and P anca, both negative. Anti-GBM antibodies, negative. ANA, negative. And the anti-double-stranded DNA, negative. We do what Zach said. We don't, go, we don't go crazy with imaging, but we do get a renal ultrasound showing that there are bilaterally normal-sized kidneys with no evidence of, of obstruction. So, Zach, with all that information, what's the diagnosis? Yeah, so um, I think it's uh, post streptococcal glomerulonephritis. And the reason why is, again, hematuria. I think about hematuria. What do I do? Glomerular, non-glomerular. Urinalysis, hematuria with red blood cell casts. They even have proteinuria. Glomerular nephritis doesn't have nephrotic range, so it's not usually at the point of where it's like greater than 3.5, but they at least have you know, two plus protein urea is what I'd be concerned with. Uh, the creatinine is a little elevated too. That's also concerning because they can get acute kidney injuries. The ASO titers elevated, anti-DNA B, that tells me that they have a recent history of like an infection from group A strep. Um, C3 is usually low in immune complexes, uh, and that's common with post-streptococcal. That's common with membranoproliferative. That's common with lupus nephritis. So that fits there. C anchors, P anchors negative, anti GBM negative, a real ankylvasculitis, rule out good pasture, ANA anti double stranded DNA. For me, rules out lupus for the most part. Okay. So, with that being said, I think this is likely post streptococcal glomerulonephritis related. I'll treat them. Usually it's supportive care and that, that hematuria should go away on its own. So, self limiting. Exactly. Cool. All right. Let's move on then to case three. Last case here solve the cause. We have a 55-year-old man, presents with flank pain and blood in his urine. The patient reports a sudden onset of severe right flank pain that radiates to his groin, accompanied by visible blood in his urine. He has a history of similar episodes, but has not had this degree of pain or hematuria before. He denies fever, chills, dysuria. He has a history of long-term NSAID use for chronic back pain and poorly controlled diabetes. Past medical history, type 2 diabetes, poorly controlled and he's had chronic back pain. He's been on NSAIDs for years. For his physical vitals, blood pressure is 140 over 90, heart rate 88, respirations 20, temp 99.5. He appears uncomfortable holding his right flank. Abdominal, there is some right CVA tenderness, otherwise non-tender, no palpable masses are found. What is your next step in the diagnostic approach? What do you have in your mind for your list of differentials? Yeah, this one, um, whenever I see flank pain and blood in the urine, I do get a little bit nervous for nephrolithiasis. Okay. So that would be on my differential. Um, the other thing, which is like, it's kind of one of those like slight zebras, but it's not too rare, is renal papillary necrosis. Um, you can see renal papillary necrosis with chronic NSAID use, and you can see it with poorly controlled diabetes mellitus. So those are some things I'm potentially thinking about. I don't see a lot of other risk factors that make me concerned about malignancy as of yet, uh, but I still would be a little bit concerned for this patient. I'm definitely going to need to get some imaging, but yeah, I would do the same thing, glomerular, non-glomerular. So get a urinalysis with microscopy, make sure there's no red blood cell cast, make sure there's no dysmorphic red blood cells, make sure there's really no protein urea. I get a renal function panel to see if there's any acute kidney injury. And then for this one, I, I'm really worried about the flank pain. I have, a, I think, a strong enough reason to get myself a CT. Um, and I would go with CT urogram, but, and that's pretty much a CT urogram. is just you're getting a CT of the abdomen and pelvis, but you're, you're giving the contrast and you're following that phase as they're making urine. So you'll get a, a with and without contrast. So you'll be able to see the filling of the actual ureteral system and you'll be able to see it without it. The reason why I want it with the urogram is because renal papillary necrosis you see better with the CT urogram, but I'd still be able to see the stone in the non-contrast filling phase of the ureter. Couldn't so. it be contraindicated to use a contrast with someone who has a kidney injury? It can be. And I think that's an important thing to think about is that in patients who do have underlying kidney injury, you always want to ask yourself the question, should I get this study? And what's the reason? And for me, it's to figure out a diagnosis that I think could have an impact on them. Yeah. And so meaning it's yeah, worth it. Exactly. So there always has to be a, a risk versus benefit. A risk of contrast induced nephropathy does exist, especially in patients with diabetes, especially in patients with CKD. Sometimes we may give them a little bit of fluids 
uh, a little bit before and a little right. bit after we give them the contrast to help with that you know, prevention. Uh, but in this patient, I need to make a diagnosis in order for me to treat them properly. So I would argue that it's necessary for me to get that CT study. So that's kind of what I would do. I would get that, make sure it's glomerular versus non-glomerular, right. get some renal function. And then on top of that, I do a CT urogram because it'll tell me if there's a stone, a mass, or renal papillary necrosis. All right. So let's run through some lab findings here. We have the urinalysis first. We have hematuria, no proteinuria, no CAS. Serum creatinine we get back is 1.9. BUN, 28. Imaging findings, we do the CT urogram. We have something that we indicate as a ring sign. Okay. What does that mean? That's usually a sign of renal papillary necrosis. So usually what happens is, is you get this area where the tissue at the papilla dies. And so the contrast can kind of like form around that area. Making a ring. Exactly. Hmm. So usually we would see that on a CT urogram. The ring sign is one of the common findings of potentially renal papillary necrosis. And that makes sense because there's risk factors. Diabetes mellitus is a risk factor. Chronic NSAID use is a risk factor. Diabetes causes uh, arteriosclerosis of those small papilla vessels. And NSAIDs cause intense vasoconstriction of those papilla vessels. And so if they get enough vasoconstriction or they get blocked up, they don't give oxygen to that papilla. It becomes ischemic, necrotic, dies. And then funny enough, it sloughs that tissue off and yeah. then sloughs off blood. So that's how they get hematuria. And the flank pain is usually because if the tissue sloughs off, it can obstruct the ureter. It can cause a back pressure and cause like hydronephrosis sometimes. And so that definitely would make sense as to this patient. And I think that kind of gives us our answer then. Okay. It's renal papillary necrosis. Cool. All right. Well, that settles that then. There's three cases. We went through it pretty systematically. It makes sense to me. It was a very interesting, really. Yeah. I think approach to hematuria sometimes can be a somewhat of a daunting thing when you think about it. But oftentimes, it's pretty straightforward. When you have a patient with hematuria, you just have to ask yourself, first off, is it real? Make sure that you check the dipstick. If it comes back that it's heme positive, get the urinalysis with microscopy and make sure that there's red cells. If there's no red cells, that could be from rhabdo. It could be from hemolysis or something like that. But if it's present, then you got to say, is it glomerular, non-glomerular? If there's CAS, dysmorphic red blood cells, heavy proteinuria, kidney injury, think about glomerular nephritis. Run those uh, serology levels and consider a renal biopsy. If you have a patient who doesn't have glomerular bleeding, they have clots in their urine, no red blood cell casts, it's not dysmorphic, they don't really have any proteinuria, you got to think, what's going on with the kidney? Is there polycystic kidney disease? Is there renal cell carcinoma? Is there renal papillary necrosis? Is there nephrolithiasis? Is there something wrong with the bladder? Do I have cystitis? Do I have pyelonephritis? Do I have bladder cancer? Prostate cancer, super rare, but it can happen. And then from there, think about that. If your history tells you what it needs to, You'll know exactly what to do. But the biggest thing for most of these patients is flank pain, get a CT. If you have dysuria, frequency, urgency, get a urine culture, especially if the urine analysis suggests an infection. Yeah. And then for most patients who have high risk of malignancy, greater than 60, they're heavy smokers, they have gross hematuria with clots or occupational exposures, get a CT urogram and a cystoscopy and rule out renal cell carcinoma or any type of bladder cell cancer. That's the way that I would work these up. All right. Well, there's hematuria. Check mark that. Done. <laughs> All right. Well, listeners, thank you guys so much for listening to this podcast. I hope that you guys enjoyed it. I hope it made sense. And I uh, love you. Thank you. And as always, until next time. Mm -hmm.